Morning everyone, uh, welcome to today's GCSE Chemistry Live Group Tutorial. Uh, I hope everyone's well and you all had a nice weekend. Um, thanks for joining us this morning, this is our first um, tutorial of the week, so thank you. Um, you. Lots of you have been to our chemistry sessions before, so you know how they work, um, but I'll just give a brief overview. So just a reminder that the session will be um, one hour long, so we'll finish at quarter to 11. And um, anytime you have a question about the content or anything else, just put it in the chat function or Q&A um, down at the bottom there. We'll keep an eye on it throughout um, and make sure we answer any questions. And we'll have a dedicated um, short Q&A period at the end to just um, answer any questions that we may have missed. Um, so I'm Tilly, I work at my tutor. Let me know if you have any questions about the online school. And our chemistry tutor today is Armin, who lots of you know already. Armand's led all of our chemistry sessions so far um, and studies medicine at King's College London um, and has been a tutor with us for a really, really long time. Um, I hope that um, you enjoyed today's session. It will be recorded, so you'll be able to access it on the MyTutor YouTube channel as usual, um, along with all the past recordings and some other resources, um, such as some short little topic videos that are related to what Armand's gone through the past few weeks which hopefully will be really helpful for you guys um, when you're wanting to go over some content and do some revision. Brilliant, so if everything's ready, um, have a great session, guys. Hi, everyone, welcome back. Um, so as Tilly said, we'll be doing titrations today. Um, specifically, we'll be explaining how and why we carry out titrations. Uh, we'll be looking at writing balanced equations for the common neutralization reactions. And then the higher tier things will be um, able to solve titration calculations. But before we go into that, just a quick recap of what we covered on Friday. So if you were here on Friday, hopefully you remember that we looked at atom economy and concentration questions. Um, we'll be building on the concentration side um, today. But just to do a quick kind of recap of those questions, let's think about atom economy first. So you may remember that the um, equation for atom economy is that the MR of the reactant that we want, so the MR of, um, sorry, the MR of the product that we want divided by the MR of the reactants. And then we always do it in a percentage form. So remember to convert to percentage, we multiply by 100. So it's the MR of the desired product divided by the MR of the reactants. So if we have a look at the question on the screen, it says, what's the atom economy of extracting iron from its ore? And we've got the equation there, it is balanced, um, and we've got the ARs. So the iron is what we want. So the MR of the desired product will be two times 56. And remember, atom economy is one of the only equations where we do look at the numbers in front or the molar numbers in front, um, just because atom economy relates to the atoms in the reactants and the products. So it all has to be balanced. And that's why we do look at these big numbers. So it's two times um, 56, which is 112. So 112 goes on top. We're then gonna divide by the MR of the reactants. So again, two times 56 plus three times 16, which is 48. So two times 56, so 112 plus 48 plus three times 12, which is 36, plus three times 16, which is 48. And then we times by 100. So if anyone's got a calculator, do you want to do that on your calculator? And then tell me what the atom economy is um, for iron. What do we think? What's the atom economy? So 112 on top divided by 112 plus 48 plus 36 plus 48. Okay, so we've got a couple of answers coming through. So someone said 45.9, 45.9. Yep, excellent. So to three significant figures, it's 45.9%. So that means the number of atoms that have appeared in the iron um, out of all the atoms in the reactants is 45.9%. So that means there's quite a lot of wastage in this carbon dioxide. Um, which is great. So obviously when we're extracting iron from its ore, we'd like to have lots of iron. But what we can see here is we've only got 45.9%. So in a question, kind of an exam question, they may ask you, what does that mean? So you can say then there's a lot of wastage for carbon dioxide and we know that carbon dioxide isn't good for the atmosphere. Um, so you can talk about that as well. Okay, so the next question then relates to concentration. So there were two um, equations that we learned for concentration last week first equation that we learn is that concentration equals mass divided by volume 
And remember the mass is in grams and the volume is in decimeters cubed. Decimeters is equal to liters, centimeters cubed is equal to milliliters. The other equation we learn is that concentration equals the moles divided by the volume. Again, moles is just moles and volume is decimeters cubed. The equation that we'll be using the most today is this one. But if we look at our question here, we've got a mass of 1.3 kg and we've got a concentration in grams per decimeter cube. That means the equation that we need to use for this question will be this one here. So 1.3 kilograms of potassium fluoride is dissolved in a solution of concentration 3.2 grams per decimeter cubed. What is the volume of the solution? So first of all, we need to rearrange our equation. So we've got concentration equals mass over volume. If we want the volume, we can use our triangle method. So this would be our mass in grams, this would be our volume in decimeters cubed, and this would be our concentration. So that means that the volume equals the mass divided by the concentration. So the mass is 1.3 kilograms. Remember, we always want it in grams. So to convert 1.3 kilograms to grams, we then times by a thousand, so that would be 1300 grams. So 1300 grams, we're then going to divide by the concentration, which is 3.2. So if you do that in your calculator, 1300 divided by 3.2, you should get um, a volume for that. So what's 1300 divided by 3.2? Um, someone's asked me, what does the N next to concentration mean? That's just a way of writing concentration in shorthand. So instead of me writing out concentration as a whole word, you can put C-O-N-C-N, -N, um, and that just means concentration in shorthand. So if people are saying 406.3. Yep, that's exactly correct. Um, so remember, we do it to three significant figures. So that would just be 406 decimeters cubed um, to three significant figures. Excellent. So before we move on to titrations, then, does anyone have any questions about atom economy or concentration questions? No? Okay, let's move on. So as I said, today we're looking at titrations. So titrations, um, we do them at school a lot, um, and it's when an acid and an alkali react to form a salt and water. And in this top bullet point over here, the one thing I want you to look at is the state symbols. So the acid and alkali will always be aqueous. I'm going to go into that in just a second. The salt formed will always also be aqueous, and water is a liquid, which we know we've covered that before. So that's the state symbols that you would be expected to know. And remember, when we react to these, we're always going to form water and a salt. A base is any substance that reacts with an acid. So a lot of people have asked before, what's the difference between a base and an alkali? So a base is just any substance that reacts with an acid and it will form a salt and water. And um, that means that metal oxides and metal hydroxides are bases. However, um, alkalis are bases that are soluble in water. Now, if you've done titration um, reactions at school, you know that we never kind of use solids. We always use liquids. So that means we always use alkalis rather than a base. So bases that are soluble in water are known as alkalis and they dissolve in water to form alkaline solutions. So it's usually metal hydroxides that are alkalis. Titrations are carried out to neutralize an acid and an alkali. Um, so now let's think about the ions then. So in an acid, we have a look at our um, balanced equation over here, we've got sulfuric acid reacting with sodium hydroxide to produce sodium sulfate plus water. So in the acid, the ion that's present to make it acid is H plus. And in the alkali, the ion that's present is hydroxide, OH minus. So what's happening is when this neutralization occurs, we get H plus being added to OH minus to then form H2O. And that is kind of the neutralization reaction between acid and an alkali or what's happening in terms of the ions. So usually we start off with a known volume and concentration of an acid or alkali and then we slowly add the other using titration equipment until neutralization occurs. So we're going to go through the steps of titration um, in just a second and uh, we'll watch a little video on it as well. And we can tell when neutralization occurs by using an indicator. So before we go through the steps of titration, let's have a little think about these indicators that are used. If you did titrations at school, you may know of some of these indicators. These are the three most common. So methyl orange, litmus and phenolphthalein. So the one that I used the most at school was this one here. 
um, and that's all we're going to see in the video as well when we watch it. Um, and what this one does is in acids, it's colourless. And when we know that we've reached a neutral kind of solution, when we add our alkali to our acid, the colour will change to light pink. But if we add too much alkali to the acid so that the, so that the solution becomes very alkaline, it, the indicator will become a dark pink colour. So that one's nice and simple, colourless and acid, dark pink in alkalis. Litmus, um, you may have come across this in other uses in chemistry, but with regards to titrations, it will be red in acids and blue in alkali. So um, you may have seen litmus paper before at school, um, and it's always classically red in acids and blue in um, alkalis. And there is this neutral colour of purple, but it's very hard um, to get it in a titration. So this isn't used as much in titrations. The third one that we need to know about is methyl orange. Um, methyl orange will be orange when it's neutral. It is red in acids and it turns yellow in alkalis. So these are the three that all the exam boards want you to know about. And often there's questions that ask you things like which indicator would you use? It doesn't matter which indicator you use as long as you get the correct name and the correct color change. So it's important that you match the correct name to the correct color change. Personally, I think the easiest one to remember is this one here, um, especially if you've seen it at school. So it's dependent on which ones you've used at school and um, to help you with that. Do we have any questions on indicators before we move on to the steps of titration? No? Okay. So a bit of a fill in the gap exercise then. So at the moment we're going to be titrating an acid and alkali as we normally do um, and we've got a known concentration and volume of acid and we're adding alkali. So we've got a known volume of acid, we're adding it into a conical flask so remember a conical flask is not like a beaker. Um, I'll show you a picture here. So this is a conical flask here. Um, and that's where our acid is added into. How do we add the acid into the conical flask? Has anyone done the titration reaction? Does anyone know what the piece of equipment is that we use um, to add the acid into the conical flask? So there's two main bits of equipment that we use in titration. Okay, so some people are saying burette. Not quite, so the burette is actually used for the alkali. Um, okay, so people are saying pipette, exactly. So it's called a volumetric pipette. So when we're adding a known volume of acid into a conical flask, remember I said that we're adding the alkali to the acid. That means we know the volume that we want to start with of acid. So the only thing that's going to give us that known volume is a volumetric pipette. So it's called volumetric pipette. And I'll show you a photo of that. So this is our volumetric pipette just here. Um, and usually there's this suctioning bulb. Um, so if you've done a titration, you'll know you tend to suck up um, the acid and then you pour it into the conical flask once you've got the correct volume. And the reason we use these is because they're very accurate. Um, so they allow you to get specific volumes. And remember, we tend to use quite small volumes in titrations. So usually the acid will only be about 25 centimeters cubed, which remember is about 20, is 25 milliliters. So it's a very small volume. Okay, the next thing says before doing this, you should first wash the pipette with what? So before we add the acid then, what do we wash the pipette with? Does anyone know? Distilled water, excellent. So we always wash the pipette with distilled water first. That's just to remove any remaining acid that might be there from a previous titration and just to make sure it's clean so it doesn't get in the way of our results. Excellent, well done. Distilled water. And then what do we wash it with? So we wash it with distilled water and then what? Yeah, acid. So um, you might be thinking, well, why do we need to wash it with acid? Well, effectively, we wash it with distilled water and then we just want to make sure the only thing in that pipette is acid. We don't want the water in the pipette. So we wash it with distilled water, then we wash it with the acid before then pipetting the acid. So excellent. Well done. OK, so now what do we do? So it says now add a few drops of what? So what do we think we add to the solutions? So we've added, we've added our pipette, we've got it in the co um, conical flask. Someone's saying indicator, exactly. So we add a few drops of indicator. Okay. So we add our indicator to the solution in the conical flask and the key word is we swirl it. So you may have heard that word a lot if you've done titration um, in school before, we always swirl. Yep, excellent. Someone's saying they can't spell indicator, you've spelt it correctly, well done. Okay. 
Then what do we rinse with distilled water? So what's the next piece of apparatus? Um, I'll give you a clue. Someone said it before, but not in the right context. Yeah, a burette. So the burette um, is what we use for the unknown volume and concentration. So remember I said that we're adding alkali to acid. So in this case, we would use a burette to put the alkali in. So we know that, for example, we've got 25 centimetres cubed of acid in our conical flask, but we're going to add alkali to the um, conical flask using a burette and the burette will allow us to add that alkali because we don't know what volume of alkali will neutralize our 25 centimeters cubed of acid so that's why we use the burette and then so we've washed it with distilled water and then what do we um, wash it with distilled water then what someone saying hydrochloric acid not quite so remember in the burette we add the alkali yep so alkali well done. So we wash it with the distilled water and then we wash it with alkali. Excellent. Well done, everyone. Um, and then allowing what to pass through the tap? What do we allow to pass through the tap? And why do we allow it to pass through the tap? Yep. So people are saying alkali. Yep. So we allow the alkali to pass through the tap. So remember a burette. I'll just show you a picture here. So this is our burette here. And there and we open that tap up to let some of the alkali through does anyone know why why do we let uh, why do we open the tap to allow the alkali through when we're washing it so effectively when we wash it with distilled water we will also open the tap and that's just to make sure yeah someone said so it can be cleared exactly so it's just to make sure there's no residual kind of um acids or alkalis in that tap um, and it's just to make sure the only thing in there is alkali or the alkali that we want um, so well done okay so we're just going to quickly go through that again so we measure a known volume of acid into a conical flask using a volumetric pipette remember that's the suction pipette where we suck up a known volume of acid before doing this, we wash the pet with distilled water and then with some of the acid. We then add a few drops of indicator to the acid in the conical flask and we swirl it. That's the key word they love at Ducessi Chemistry. We then rinse the burette with distilled water and then with some of the alkali, allowing some alkali to pass through the tap. Remember, that's to make sure that the bottom of the burette, so where the tap is and below that, that's all only got alkali in it and nothing else. And then we pour the alkali um, you're going to use into the burette. Okay, so then what do we record the reading on? Someone's saying, do we need to say the specific indicator? No, so in this case, I'm, it's just a fill in the gap exercise. So remember, I've just put indicator here. I've gone through some of the indicators. In questions, they might ask you, which indicator would you use? Again, it's just about saying which indicator you would like to use and the color change that, um, that matches that indicator. So for example, there's no point putting methyl orange and then saying that it's colorless in acids and it turns pink in alkalis because that's the color change for phenolphthalein, not um, for methyl orange. So it's important that um, you remember both the indicator and the colour change that corresponds to that indicator in exam questions. But this is just a fill in the gap exercise, so there's no specific indicator that you would need here. Okay, so the next step or step four says record the reading on the what and what volume is that? So any ideas, what do we record the reading on? If you want, I'll go back to the previous page and just say the last step said that we pour the alkali into the burette. So what are we going to record the reading on and what's that volume called? Yep, excellent. Someone said burette, brilliant. So we record the reading on the burette. What's that volume called then? Not titrate volume, no. Nope. Any other ideas? So we record the volume on the burette. What's the volume called? So I'll give you a clue. It's the first volume that you read. So what's another word for first or if you're just beginning something? So remember when we're doing titration, yep, start, excellent. So someone said start, so it's called the start volume. So we record the reading on the burette and then we have a start volume. So remember in titration, your burette is the one that's going to decrease in volume because you're gonna add your alkali to your acid from the burette. So you'll have a start volume and then you'll have the opposite of start, which we'll come on to in just a second. So excellent. You can say initial volume, but the correct um, word is start volume. All right, that's the one that most of the textbooks will use. 
So then we open the tap to release a small amount of alkali into the flask. What do we do to the flask to make sure that the two solutions are mixed? I'll give you a clue. This word's been used on the previous page and it's the word that I said GCSE chemistry love in titration questions. Swirl, yeah, excellent, well done. So we swirl the flask to make sure that the two solutions are mixed. Okay, um, before we move on to step five, I just want to say that when we do titration questions, we open the tap to release a small amount of alkali. A lot of um, mark schemes like the word dropwise. And dropwise essentially means you add one drop of alkali at a time. Does anyone know why we add the alkali dropwise or why we add it one drop at a time? What's the purpose for that? Yep, so that the most accurate reading can be obtained so we can see when it neutralizes and to spot the color change. Excellent, well done everyone. Exactly, so if we don't do it drop wise, what can happen is um, you can overshoot the neutralization mark. So remember I said that if we're using the indicator phenolphthalein, it will be colorless and acid, but when we're adding the alkali, you'll get that pink color. And if you overshoot, you'll get a dark pink color, but at neutralization, it's kind of a faint or light pink. So what's really important is that you add it drop wise so that you get that light pink color, because if you add too much, it's gonna go dark pink, and then you know you've gone past neutralization. So that's why the mark schemes like this word, drop wise. Okay, so step five, keep on repeating which step until the indicator in the flask changes. Yep, step four, so we're going to keep on um, repeating step four, so specifically it's this step, this part of step four, so open the tap to release a small amount of alkali or drop wise and keep swirling. So again, what's really important is that as we add every drop, we swirl the flask. So you'll see in the video that we're going to watch in just a second, um, that when you add the alkali to the acid, it will go pink. That doesn't mean you've reached neutralization yet, it's just the initial reaction of the alkaline alkali hitting the indicator in the acid solution will make it turn pink but when you swirl it it will become colorless again so it's really important to swirl it and make sure that the alkali um, doesn't uh, kind of stay on top we want it to kind of mix in with the whole solution in the acid and then allow it to go colorless again good okay so the next one people are saying is color exactly so keep on repeating step four until the indicator in the flask changes color Excellent. This shows when the acid in the flask has completely reacted with the alkali added from the burette. Record the reading on the burette. Okay, so we started with a start volume. So what do you think the second volume is that we read? Excellent. End volume. Well done. So it's called the end volume. Um, so this, this sentence is a little bit tricky. So we record the reading on the burette. That's the end volume. At what? What do we read it at? So we record it, it's the end volume, and we read it at what? It's not at the end, um, but what do we read it at? Again, it's a little bit tricky. So if you've done a titration question, um, or titration in school, you should know that when we're reading volumes, what do we specifically need to do? There are two things involved when we're reading volumes from a burette. Okay, so no one's giving me that answer, that's fine. So we read it at eye level. Um, so what that means is that often um, you have to kind of bend down and read the volume at eye level and then someone's actually given me the second answer and they've said that it's the meniscus which is exactly correct. So we read it at eye level ensuring it is the bottom of the meniscus. Okay, does anyone know what a meniscus is? What is a meniscus? Yep, the curve at the water. Okay, so just imagine um, that we've got our burette here, or just a tall beaker for example, and we've got water filling up, and the water kind of fills up to about there. And what you will always see, if you kneel down to eye level, is that the water will have this curve at the bottom. So this curve here. And that is called the meniscus. And so what we do is when we're reading, our volume, we always read at the bottom of the meniscus. We wouldn't read it here, we would read it here at the bottom, and that's called the meniscus. And it's really important that you're at eye level to see where the bottom of the meniscus is. Someone's asking, how do you spell meniscus? So I've written it on the screen here. It's M-E-N-I-S-C-U-S, -S, so meniscus. 
um, and it's just a fancy word for the bottom, um, as someone said, of the water level. So it's really important that you read that and that's just because water settles like that but the actual volume is where the bottom of the meniscus is. Great, okay, so I'll just read that again um, so we can do the last part of step five. So we keep on repeating step four until the indicator in the flask changes color. This shows when the acid in the flask has completely reacted with the alkali added from the burette. Record the reading on the burette, that's the end volume at eye level, ensuring it is the bottom of the meniscus and work out the volume of alkali that has run into the flask. What's that volume known as then? So we work out the volume of alkali that's run into the flask. Remember, the volume of alkali that's run into the flask will be the start volume minus the end volume. So if, for example, in our burette, we started off with 50 centimetres cubed and our end volume says 22 centimetres cubed, then we would do 50 minus 22, which would give us 28 centimetres of cube. So what would that 28 centimetres cubed represent? Yeah, the titer. Excellent. So it's called the titer. T-I-T-R-E, the titer. You can say titrate, um, but the correct word is titer. Okay, so we then keep repeating the titration until you get two results within what of each other. So we've done a whole titration, we're then going to keep repeating that, usually at least three times, um, but there isn't kind of an end limit, it's actually what this sentence is trying to say, so we get the two results within what. Does anyone know what the two results need to be within? Someone said one decimal place. Yep, so someone's saying 0.1. It is, it's 0.1 and what's really important is it's centimetres cubed. So remember in burettes and pipettes they measure in centimetres cubed or millilitres, so it's 0.1 centimetres cubed. You can sometimes get away with saying 0.2, which would be 20 millilitres, um, sorry, 0.2 centimetres cubed, um, but 0.1 is the officially correct answer. So 0.1 centimetres cubed of each other and these precise results are called what? So if we've got two results within 0.1 centimetres cubed of each other, they're called what? Concordant, excellent, well done. So concordant. Again, that's just a fancy word um, for saying that the two results are within 0.1 centimetres cubed of each other. And then we can calculate a what value to give the most accurate results. Mean, excellent, really well done. Okay, so before we watch our video then, we'll just quickly go over this page. So we finished by adding the alkali to the burette and on step four then we record the reading on the burette which is our start volume. We open the tap to release a small amount of alkali into that conical flask. Remember we do that drop wise. We then swell the flask to make sure that the two solutions are mixed. We're going to keep on repeating step four until the indicator in the flask changes colour and this shows when the acid in the flask has completely reacted with the alkali added from the burette and then we record the reading on the burette, that's the end volume at eye level, ensuring it's the bottom of the meniscus, and then we work out the volume of alkali that's run into the flask, which is known as a titer. Remember that the volume will be the start volume minus the end volume. And we keep repeating the titration until we get two results within 0.1 centimetres cubed of each other. These precise results are called concordant, and then we calculate a mean. So just to say, to calculate that mean, if, for example, we've got two results that say 28.10 and 28.00, they would be concordant with each other. So to calculate that mean, we would do 28.10 plus 28.00 divided by 2. All right, that's how we calculate a mean. So it's just like in maths, we add up all the values and divide by how many there are. Excellent. Um, someone's asking me to explain concordant again. Yep, so it's just a fancy word and it, all it means is that the two results are within 0.1 centimetres cubed of each other. So these results here, for example, 28.10 and 28 are within 0.1 centimetres cubed of each other um, and therefore they're concordant. So usually what happens when you do titration reactions is that the first one that you do will be um, not accurate at all because te uh, you tend to overshoot the neutralization mark. So for example, we might get 29 centimeters cubed on our first go. And then after that, you'll become a bit more accurate. You'll start adding it dropwise, you'll know what you're doing, and then you'll tend to get concordant results. And it's really important that you only include concordant results in mean calculations. Okay, excellent, well done. So let's watch, um, a quick video. So remember these are just the equipment that you use. So the beaker is just to add the alkali to the burette and the conical flask is what we pipette the acid into. So okay. 
So hopefully you can see what's going on. So they're talking about reading the burette from the meniscus. So here we're pipetting some acid over here and we're putting it into the conical flask. It's going into that conical flask, they're using hydrochloric acid. And then they're adding the phenolphthalein indicator. So it's gonna be colorless. Remember in acid, phenolphthalein is colorless. So we can see that hasn't changed. We're then adding sodium hydroxide to the burette. So this is our burette over here. We're using filter to help us, a funnel, sorry. And then we add to the burette. And then what you can see is he's adding it um, and it's changing pink, but when he swirls it, it goes colorless. So the alkali is being added to the acid. He's swirling it and it's going colorless. And he's not quite doing it drop wise, um, but he should be doing it drop wise. In this video, they're just trying to show the color change really and the equipment. So yeah, you should be adding it drop wise. And then eventually what's going to happen is um, it's going to all turn pink. And actually in this video, he does overshoot the mark um, because he wasn't adding drop wise. So you're gonna see it go a very dark pink eventually. So again, he's swirling after every drop. Okay. Someone's asking, how does the color change when you swirl it? It's because when you first, um, when the alkali first reaches the acid, it reacts with the indicator. But when you swirl it, it reacts with the acid. And because there's still more acid in there, so there you go, that's the end point. Again, he has overshot the mark, so it's gone a very dark pink color. Um, so, so sorry, someone asked me, um, why does it turn pink when it hits um, that solution? So when the alkali first gets added to the acid solution in the conical flask, it reacts with the indicator and turns pink. But when you swirl it, it reacts with the acid. And because there's more acid in there, the, uh, it will go colorless. Until it reaches the point where the acid and alkali are equal, um, then it will um, change into that light pink color. But if you overshoot like he did, it went dark pink. So that means there was more alkali in there than acid. So that's why. Excellent. How does the amount of indicator affect the result? It doesn't really. Um, usually you just add a few drops of indicator. It won't really affect the result. Um, okay, so let's move on then. So the second objective that we were going to do today was about balancing titration equations. So what's really important is um, that for doing titration calculations, you need to know how to write a balanced equation for a lot of the key acids and alkalis. So we're going to go through um, most of them in these three questions. So the first key acid you need to know about is nitric acid. Does anyone know the formula for nitric acid? So hopefully using these three questions, we're going to come up with a quick bank of acids and alkalis that you should know for GCSE chemistry. So does anyone know the formula for nitric acid? Okay, someone's saying NO3, not quite NO3. Yep, HNO3, excellent. So remember, it's the H in the acid the H plus ion that makes it acidic. So HNO3 is nitric acid. Excellent. Okay, before we do the rest of that question, hydrochloric acid, what's hydrochloric acid? Um, what's the chemical formula of hydrochloric acid? HCl, excellent. Yep, what about carbonic acid? So there's four acids that you tend to need to know. Um, so we've got nitric acid, hydrochloric acid. What about carbonic acid? Does anyone know that one? Not HCl not HCA, so that's CA is calcium. Excellent, so someone said H2CO3, brilliant. So that's carbonic acid. And the other acid you need to know, the reason it's not here is because we did it in the beginning, it was sulfuric acid, so H2SO4. So they're the four acids we need to know, sulfuric acid, nitric acid, hydrochloric acid, and carbonic acid. Excellent. Okay, and then hydroxides, they all tend to kind of be the same. So remember I said the alkalis tend to be metal hydroxides. So if we look at our periodic table, the first hydroxide we need is barium hydroxide. So barium is in group two, it's over here. So that means what, if it's in group two, what does that mean? What charge does it form as an ion if it's in group two? Two plus, excellent. So for those that don't know, so the barium ion will form a two plus ion and that's because it's in group two, which means it has two electrons in its outer shell. So it wants to lose those electrons when it reacts. And if it loses those electrons, it will have two more protons than electrons. So it becomes a Ba2 plus. And what about the hydroxide ion? Does anyone remember what charge the hydroxide ion has on it? So I went through this at the beginning, the hydroxide ion, what charge does that have on it? 
OH minus. Excellent. Well done, everyone. So if we react barium and hydroxide, we've got an OH minus and a Ba2 plus. So when they react, that means that barium has two electrons it wants to lose and hydroxide has one electron it wants to gain. So if we react the barium with hydroxide, we will form Ba OH2. And that's because barium has two electrons it needs to lose, but hydroxide can only gain one. So for barium and hydroxide to react, we need two hydroxides for every one barium, so BaOH2. So to write out the balanced equation for nitric acid with barium hydroxide, we have HNO3, which is our nitric acid. Barium hydroxide is BaOH2. It then forms what and what? Does anyone remember when we do neutralization reactions, what ha for happens? So we've got nitric acid and barium hydroxide. What are the two products of neutralization reactions? A salt and water. Excellent. So to work out what the salt will be, remember that the water will be your H2O. And so what you'll be left with is barium nitrate. And um, we went through that barium is a two plus ion. Does anyone know the charge on nitrate NO3? Anyone know the charge on the NO3 ion? Minus, yeah, it's just one minus. And the way we know that is because hydrogen forms a positive ion. So if hydrogen and nitrate react, that means that there must be one hydrogen for every one nitrate. So nitrate just forms a minus. So if we combine barium and nitrate, what's the salt that's going to be formed then? Excellent people that are saying one minus, you're exactly correct. Someone's asked me to go back to slide six. I will once we um, finish doing this balancing um, equation. Okay, so we've got barium and nitrate. What's the salt that's going to be formed? Someone's saying BaNO3, not quite. So remember there's two electrons that barium wants to lose, but nitrate can only gain one. So what does that mean? When we combine them, barium's got two electrons to give, but nitrate can only gain one. Yeah, BaNO3 too, excellent, well done. So Ba NO3, 2. And then the final product, as someone said, is water. Great. So if we want to balance that then, remember we always look at what's in excess first. So we've got one barium, one barium, two nitrates, one nitrate. So first of all, that's our one difference. So we can put a two here. And that now means that we've got two nitrates, which matches, and we've got two hydrogens. So now if we have a look, we've got two hydrogens on the reactant side and two hydrogens on the product side, but on our, sorry, and on it's still on the reactant side, so there's four hydrogens on the reactant side and on our product side, there's only two hydrogens. So if we put a two here, we get four. So now if we have a look, one barium, one barium, um, we've got two nitrates, two nitrates, four hydrogens, four hydrogens, and then oxygens, there's two oxygens and two oxygens. So that is a fully balanced equation. Good, well done everyone that gave me um, the answer to that question. Someone's asking, what is the difference when the number is in front of the formula and after the bracket? Excellent um, question. So after the bracket, like here, that's related to how many nitrates there are with regards to barium. So for example, I said that barium has a two plus charge and nitrate has a minus charge. So that means that barium can lose two electrons for every one electron that nitrate gains. So if it wants to react with nitrate, there needs to be two nitrates to accept those two electrons. And that's why it's NO3 two, which says that there's two nitrates reacting with one barium. If we then put a two in front, that means there are two bariums, but four nitrates. So it's just about multiples. So the big number in front is a multiple of the compound or the formula, whereas the small numbers relate to what's actually in that formula. So what is reacting with what and how many of each. So that's kind of the ratio, if you want. So there's one, one barium to two nitrates in that formula, so that's the ratio. But if we put a big two in front, the ratio is not gonna change, it's just gonna be multiplied, so it becomes two to four. Okay, let's have a go at the next one. So a balanced equation for sodium hydroxide reacting with hydrochloric acid. So does anyone know what the um, formula for sodium hydroxide is? If not, we can work it out using the ionic charge. So we said that OH is OH minus. So we know that that's the charge on OH. If we look at our periodic table, we can see that sodium is in group one. So what charge does the sodium ion have? Then Then 
Yep, NaOH and sodium ion has a one plus charge. Excellent. So the reason for that is we've got the OH minus and sodium is Na plus. So when they react, it's just NaOH. So the balanced equation for sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid is NaOH plus hydrochloric acid. Remember that the water, which we can see HHO, is not going to form the salt. So the salt will be sodium chloride, NaCl. And the reason for that is our Na is a plus charge. Cl, if we look at our groups, is over here, it's in group seven. So that means it has seven electrons in its outer shell and it wants to gain one electron. If it gains that one electron, it will have one more electron than proton, so it has a one minus charge. So therefore, it's NaCl, so they react together, one sodium for one chlorine, and then we form water. And if we have a look at the balance um, of this, then it's already balanced. There's one sodium, one chlorine, one sodium, one chlorine, two hydrogens, one oxygen, two hydrogens, one oxygen. Okay, um, we won't balance the third question because I'm aware of the time and I want to go on to some concentration questions for the higher tier titration calculations. Um, would you not need state symbols? You can need, have I, um, so in these questions I've not said that we need state symbols, but remember that the state symbols are always the same. Acids and alkalis will be aqueous, the salt will be aqueous, and water will be liquid. So we went through that right at the beginning. So that's always the case. All right. Okay, I'm just going to go back to slide six because someone asked me to go back to slide six. Um, so the person asked me to go back to slide six. Do you have a question about it? If not, we'll move on to titration calculations quickly, um, just because I'm sure a lot of you want to go on to that because it's the higher tier things and it's the final objective for today. Okay, so no question on slide six then. Yep, let's move on. All right. Okay, so titration calculations. So what's really important with these is that we're able to write a balanced equation. Um, what I'm going to do is we're going to focus on the second and third question just because we know how to write balanced equations now. We've gone over that. Um, so the first question asks us to write a balanced equation, um, but we can do that if we've got time later. Someone's just asking, can you just drop down the third equation of the balanced equation later, please? Um, yes, if I've got time, I will do that. So let's have a go at trying titration calculations. And I'm going to try and give you a stepwise method for doing these um, because they all tend to be pretty much the same. So in a titration, we've got 25 centimetres cubed. First thing, centimetres cubed of 0.2 moles per decimetre cubed of sodium hydroxide solution. So that means in our conical flask, we've got our alkali. So we're adding hydrochloric acid to our alkali. And the reason I know that is because we've got a known volume and concentration of sodium hydroxide, which is what would happen if it's in the conical flask. We then know it's exactly neutralized by 22.70 centimeters cubed of dilute solution of hydrochloric acid. So what we can see here is sodium hydroxide is reacting with hydrochloric acid to form sodium chloride and water. That's the reaction or the balanced equation we just wrote. So that's supposed to be an arrow there. So the first thing we need to know is our concentration equations. So remember from last Friday, there are two. In titration calculations, there's only one you need to know. It's moles over volume. So we always start off with which um, either the acid or alkali we have the most information about. And in this case, we have the most information about the alkali. And that is we know its volume and we know its concentration. So if we know its volume and we know its concentration, we can work out the number of moles. So we can rearrange this equation. And if we use our triangle, we know that the concentration goes here, volume goes here in decimeters cubed, and the moles go here. So the number of moles equals concentration times the volume. So in this case, the concentration is 0.2, so we do 0.2 times the volume of 25, but it's in centimetres cubed, so we need to convert to decimetres cubed. So we divide by 1,000, which will give us 0.025. So remember, the decimal place moves 3, so 2.5, 0 0.25, 0 0.025. And if we do that into our calculator, we do 0.2 times 0.025, what do we get? What do we get? Okay, so it's 0 0.005. Excellent, so 0 0.005. So that's the number of moles of sodium hydroxide, 0 0.005 moles. And then we look at our balanced equation. 
So the first step was to calculate the number of moles of alkali. And if you were doing it as a generic step, it's the number of moles of whichever, either the acid or alkali, you've got the most information about. So we've got the most information about the alkali, sodium hydroxide. So we calculated the number of moles of sodium hydroxide. We then look at our balanced equation to see, well, what's the ratio of sodium hydroxide to hydrochloric acid? And what we can see is it's one sodium hydroxide to one hydrochloric acid. So what that means is if there's 0.005 moles of sodium hydroxide, there are also 0.005 moles of hydrochloric acid. So if we want to calculate the concentration of hydrochloric acid, we've got the number of moles and we've got a volume, so we can calculate it. So the concentration will be the number of moles, 0.005, divided by the volume. And again, it's in centimetres cubed, so we need to convert it to decimetres cubed, so it'll be 0.0227. And if you do that on the calculator, you get 0 0.005 divided by 0 0.0227. You'll get an answer of 0.22 um, to three decimal places. So it'll be 0 0.220 to three decimal places. And that is its concentration in moles per decimeter cubed. Now, if you read that question again carefully, it's asking for the concentration in grams per decimeter cubed. Does anyone know how we convert a concentration in moles per decimeter cubed to a concentration in grams per decimeter cubed? And I will say there's only one step involved. So how do we convert a concentration in moles per decimeter cubed to a concentration in grams per decimeter cubed? Does anyone know? Someone saying times by a thousand? Nope. So we've got a, a concentration in moles, how do we convert it to grams? Okay, so if you remember, or if you were here last week, you may have remembered um, some of the equations that we used with moles. And moles is equal to mass over MR. And the other thing we know is that concentration can also equal mass over volume. So, all this combines to basically say if we want to convert moles to decimeter cube, moles per decimeter cube to grams per decimeter cubed, we just multiply the concentration by the MR of the compound or of the acid. So the MR of hydrochloric acid. So H has an AR of one and chlorine has an AR of 35.5. So to convert it to grams per decimeter cubed, it would be 35.5 plus one, which is 36.5. So 0 0.220 times 36.5. And if you do that on the calculator, you will get an answer of 8.04 to three significant figures. And that is it in grams per decimeter cubed. Okay. Um, I think let's go on to the Q&A and then if we've got time, um, what we'll do is we'll go through another titration calculation question. So are there any Q&A questions? Does anyone have any questions for me? Yeah, if you guys could put um, any questions in the chat or Q&A, um, I'll just answer a couple of questions. Um, for me, there was a question earlier about um, we've been specifying on the timetable some sessions are higher, some sessions are foundation level for various subjects. Um, essentially, those will be if the session only covers foundation or higher level material. If it doesn't specify, that means that it's just a usual lesson covering quite a range of levels. So it will usually um, sort of start at an average level and go up to higher. Um, but if it specifies foundation, that'll only be a foundation session. I hope that makes sense. Um, and there was a question asking, will geography be added to the timetable? Um, not anytime soon. So apologies for any confusion over this. It did say on the, on the site that geography may be coming soon. Um, currently, this won't be added over the next few weeks. Um, so I can confirm that. Um, um, and someone's asked, could you explain the convention again, please? Um, yep. Do you mind? What's, what, what do you mean by convention? Convention of about what? See if there are any other questions from earlier. I think most have been answered. Okay, that's great. Um, okay, so uh, that person's not said what they mean by convention. So let's do another titration question then. 
Oh, someone's asking, can you just go over the last conversion again? Sure. So the last conversion, um, I assume you're talking about how do we go from moles per decimeter cubed to grams per decimeter cubed. Um, what I'll do is I'll go through the whole question again, um, just because I think this is quite a key question. So the first step in titration calculations is we want to calculate the number of moles of whichever either the acid or alkali we have the most information about. All right. So in this question, we have the concentration of sodium hydroxide and we have a volume of sodium hydroxide, but the acid we only have a volume for. So the one that we have the most information about is sodium hydroxide. We can then use our equation concentration equals moles over volume to calculate the number of moles of sodium hydroxide and we did that so the moles was equal to 0 0.005 so remember that the moles is equal to concentration times volume so the concentration was 0 0.2 we then multiplied that by 0 0.025 and remember that's because we converted the centimeters cubed to decimeters cubed then we look at the equation. So we've got the number of moles of sodium hydroxide. We now need to know the ratio in the balanced equation of hydrochloric acid to sodium hydroxide. And what we could see is that one sodium hydroxide reacts with one hydrochloric acid. So if the number of moles of sodium hydroxide is 0 0.005, that means the number of moles of hydrochloric acid is also 0 0.005. So then what we can do is we now have the number of moles of hydrochloric acid and we have a volume. So then we can rearrange our equation so the concentration equals the moles, which we had 0 0.005 divided by the volume, which was 22.7. Again, we need to convert it to decimeters cubed. So that would be 0 0.0227. Remember to convert to decimeters cubed, we divide by 1000. So it would be 0 0.005 divided by 0 0.0227 as here. And that then gives you um, an answer, um, which I've not written down, um, which is quite, oh here, sorry, is 0 0.220. So 0 0.220 was the concentration in moles per decimeter cubed. But this question was asking for the concentration in grams per decimeter cubed. So what we need to do to convert from moles decimeter cubed to grams per decimeter cubed is times by the MR. So the MR of hydrochloric acid. Um, and that's because if you remember, um, the moles and the mass are very linked. So here, this equation. If we want the mass, which is what we want, we want the grams instead of the moles, we can rearrange it. And so we know that the mass is equal to moles times MR. So that's exactly why we times by the MR. We've got the number of moles or the moles per decimeter cubed, which is 0 0.220. So we times it by the MR. And the MR of hydrochloric acid is 36.5. So remember to calculate an MR, you add up the ARs. And the AR is the relative atomic mass of each element. So there's a hydrogen in hydrochloric acid, which has an AR of one. And there's a chlorine, which has an AR of 35.5. We then add those up, that's 36.5. So we do 0 0.220, which was our concentration in moles per decimeter cubed, and we times by 36.5, which gives us an answer of 8.04 grams per decimeter cubed. Um, and that's how we got it. Um, okay, great. Um, are there any questions about that? If not, I think we'll do another... Um, question. Someone's asking me to drop down the third equation. Okay, so actually um, I will do that then. Let's do the balanced equation here. So someone's asking for the balanced equation of this one. It is a tricky one. So it's ammonium hydroxide reacting with carbonic acid. So we said that the um, compound of carbonic acid is H2CO3. Ammonium hydroxide, does anyone know what the ammonium ion is and what charge is on the ammonium ion? So we know ammonia is NH3, but what about the ammonium ion? What charge is on the ammonium ion? What do we know about that? So okay if we don't know. So the ammonium ion is NH4 plus. So NH4 plus, that's the ammonium ion. It's just something to remember. So that's the ammonium ion. We know that hydroxide is OH minus. So when they react, it's just NH4OH. So Carbonic acid reacts with NH4OH. Remember that's because the charges are plus and minus. So one ammonium reacts with one hydroxide. It's then going to form ammonium carbonate. So does anyone know the charge on a carbonate ion? Um, the person that said uh, that the NH4 is a plus ion, well done. So carbonate, does anyone know the charge on a carbonate ion or CO3? What's the charge on that? If you don't know, have a look at this. We know that hydrogen is plus, so what must the carbonate ion be? Not CO3 minus, it's not minus. Have another go. So remember, when we form carbonic acid, the H is a plus ion, 
But why are there two hydrogens reacting with carbonate then? Why is it not just HCO3? Because if CO3 was minus, great, some people have said two minus. So if CO3 was minus, remember then it would just be HCO3 minus, but it can't be because there's two hydrogens. So that means it's a two minus. That means that hydrogen has one um, electron to give, but carbonate has two electrons that it wants. So that means we must need two hydrogens to react with one carbonate. So now if we want to form ammonium carbonate, ammonium has a positive charge one, carbonate has a two minus charge. So to react an ammonium with carbonate, ammonium only has one electron to give, but carbonate needs two. So that means we have two ammoniums, NH42, reacting with one carbonate, which is CO3. So that's ammonium carbonate. And then it forms water. Um, and we can balance that equation as well. Is there any place where you can find a list of all the charges so I can learn them all? That's a really good question. Um, the main ones that you need to know are actually here today. So hydrogen is plus, hydroxide is minus, nitric acid is NO3 um, minus, sulfate, SO4 2 minus, carbonate, CO3 2 minus, um, and ammonium is NH4 plus. I think that's most of the ones that you need to know about that you can't get off the periodic table um, and it's always related to acids and alkalis. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. So just to balance this equation then, um, if we have a look at what's different, we can see that there are two ammoniums but only one um, on the reactant side. So what we can do is make that a two. And then if we have a look, um, it should um, pretty much all be balanced. So um, apart from the water, so we put a two here, we've now got four hydrogens. Um, and then if we have a look, we've got our two ammoniums, one carbonate, one carbonate, two hydrogens plus two is four, so four hydrogens, and then two oxygens and two oxygens. So that's a balanced equation there. Okay, given that we've got three minutes left, let's try and do one concentration, oh, one more concentration question. Um, these are all exam questions, by the way. So let's have a go at this one here just very quickly then. So 25 centimetres cubed of barium hydroxide of unknown concentration was placed in a conical flask. The burette was filled with 0.062 moles per decimeter cubed of nitric acid. A titration perform, uh, was performed to determine that 40 mils of nitric acid was required to neutralise the barium hydroxide. So we've got the most information about nitric acid. We know it's a concentration and volume. So if we want to calculate the number of moles of nitric acid, we do the concentration, 0.062, and we times by the volume. Remember, that volume is in millilitres, which is equivalent to centimetres cubed. We want it in decimetres cubed. So we divide by 1,000, which gives us an answer of 0.04. We then times by 0.062, which gives us a concentration of 0.0248. So we times by 0 0.04 and then we get a concentration of 0 0.0248 and that's it in moles. We then look at our equation, our balanced equation, and what we can see is that barium hydroxide reacts with nitric acid. We've just calculated the number of moles of nitric acid and it's two nitric acids react with one barium hydroxide. So if the number of moles of nitric acid are 0 0.00248, that means the number of moles of um, barium hydroxide are divided by two, because there's only one mole of that, which gives us 0.00124. So then to calculate the concentration of barium hydroxide, concentration equals moles over volume, so 0.00124, divided by the volume of 25. Again, it needs to be in decimeters cubed, so that would be 0.025, which gives you a concentration of 0 0.0496 moles per decimeter cubed. Now I've gone through that very quickly, um, but tomorrow, no, sorry, on Wednesday morning, we'll do a quick recap of titration questions before we go on to gas volumes. Um, yep, yeah. any quick questions before we finish off then? So the final answer was 0 0.0496 moles per decimeter cubed. Brilliant, thanks Armin. Um, and just remember guys, when this is uploaded later, to later today, you can always um, go back and watch that last question again. Um, so brilliant, I think we'll end there. Um, thank you so much for today's session, Armin, and thanks for attending guys. Um, as Armin said, the next chemistry session is Wednesday morning at the same time. Um, but if you join us for any other sessions, just a reminder, we have Maths Foundation, Physics and History later today. Um, and you can find the links to those on the timetable. 
Um, brilliant, so thank you for today and I'll see everyone in another session very soon. Bye. Bye.